So before we dive into that discussion, we'll start with a few announcements and we will put the direct links in chat. First slide, please. Second slide. Awesome. AEGB e-learning courses are now live. We've added several new on-demand courses so you can earn continuing education credits at your convenience. We will continue to upload recorded webinars and offer additional resources here in the future. Log in to register and see what's new. Next slide. The AEGB commercial team has released a revision to the 2022 commercial guidebook to better align with stated intents, provide additional clarity, and in some cases to account for new local ordinances adopted since the rating launch. The updated 2022 commercial rating guidebook can be downloaded from the help tab of the online rating system or the ORS. Please visit, please visit our Speak Up Austin page to provide ongoing feedback. Next slide. Our next seminar in July will be focused on embodied carbon, full carbon accounting, and carbon emissions reduction. We're in the process of lining up some great speakers for that, and we'll have more information on our website soon. Next slide. This seminar has been submitted for AIA Learning Units, GBCI CE Hours for Lead Professionals, and AICP CM Credits. Austin Energy Green Building will provide certificates of completion for self-reporting and report AIA hours for all of those that attend the entire webinar. All certificates will be emailed. A follow-up email will be sent in a few days with links to the recorded webinar and other resources. Next slide. And here's the AIA quality assurance slide. Next slide. And these are the learning objectives for today's seminar. Next slide. And with that, we'll get started with the main program for today's discussion on resilience tools, systems, and strategies. If you have any questions during our speakers' presentations, please be sure to use the Q&A window throughout the presentations. We've scheduled time at the end of the seminar to discuss. Next slide. Today, we are joined by Shivani Langer, Director of Regenerative Design, Senior Project Architects with Perkins and Will, Justice Jones, Wildfire Mitigation Officer with Austin Fire, Scott Henson, Chief Technology Officer with Pecan Street, and Valerie Paxton, Environmental Conservation Program Manager with Austin Energy. A big thank you to our wonderful speakers who have agreed to help out with the seminar. Our first speaker today is Shivani Langer. Shivani serves as Director of Regenerative Design Senior Project Architect at Perkins & Will. With over 23 years of experience serving in the dual role of an architect and a sustainability leader, Shivani has been instrumental in pushing the boundary of high performance and wellness strategies in all projects across firms. She has led numerous research projects over the years and has provided education and awareness of best practices through various publications and presentations. She serves as a board member for USGBC, CTX, and school PTAs. Being a mom of two girls in public schools, she's a firm believer in volunteering and serving the community. Without further ado, please take it away, Shivani. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. Guessing everyone can see that. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm excited to kick this uh, presentation off um, and because I am the first one to uh, present, I actually get to define resiliency for um, the session and for everyone. Like Caitlin said, I am a senior project architect, so I work a lot in buildings uh, and that's why my definition of resiliency is all about resilient design. And it is um, the practice of identifying vulnerabilities to natural and man-made threats in building cities and their communities. But beyond identifying vulnerabilities, a big portion of resilient design is also adapting strategies. So once we have identified vulnerabilities, can we actually adapt strategies 
in our designs to increase the resilience of our buildings. Now, a lot of the times we consider resilience to be something that we just survive a disaster or survive an event. But the big portion of that is that we need to have strategies that can help recover, grow, and flourish. And um, as you saw that we, we talk about regenerative design, the whole concept of regenerative design is to be able to grow and flourish, not just survive. Uh, so that's the big portion of uh, how we define resilient design. Uh, and just reiterating that places that are designed, planned, and organized for resilience have a significantly greater chance of weathering physical trauma and social provocations. They're also much more likely, likely to regenerate and prosper afterwards. So again, the whole concept of growing and flourishing beyond just recovering. And because I'm one of the first ones, I actually also get to talk about uh, all the gloom and doom that we need to talk about when we talk about resiliency. So there is um, definitely a lot of us have experienced it ourselves, but there are acute shocks that come our way uh, constantly. Uh, these, as we are, uh, as the years are passing by, there are many that we may not have talked about in the past, but we are constantly looking at um, shocks that keep increasing. So this slide probably will keep adding to the acute shocks that are hitting us uh, constantly. And very the re in the recent past, in a pandemic, we are talking about incidents and threats of uh, safety that are also adding being added on to these acute shocks. But beyond the acute shocks, we also have to remember that these um, shocks do not actually in, impact everyone in the same way. So they are exaggerated by stresses, chronic stress, stresses that are already facing our communities. And these stresses could be uh, poverty, it could be unemployment, it could be uh, poor air quality, poor water quality. Um, it could be um, racial factors. So a lot of different kinds of impacts um, are all related to what a community might already be experiencing, whether it's a, because of its, the community's location, it's because of social factors, e um, economic state status, and all of those um, are actually causing compounded risks beyond just the stressors and beyond just the shocks. It's also because of all the other stresses that the community may already be facing. So we need to be aware of that. And um, just so many uh, different stress that we need to be looking into. And as the time is going by, as years are going, um, uh, we are looking at global water stress, bad air quality that's constantly degrading, habitat degradation, food insecurity. And UN International Organization is saying that, uh, or International Organization for Migration Projects is projecting that 1.5 billion people may have to leave their homes by 2050. And the, definitely it's the poorest and the smallest nations that will be forced to migrate. So it's just unfortunate that these numbers are constantly growing and uh, more and more staggering numbers that are coming our way. And I also, <laughs> am, because I'm one of the first speakers, I, I can place blame. Post-industrial era has completely changed what we are talking about. If you all see the carbon dioxide levels um, at nine, year 1950, was never above that line that you see there, the dotted line. But at the current level, look at how far it has jumped. And uh, this is, uh, there are st st staggering numbers again, um, just because of all this, we are losing 27,000 square miles of Arctic sea, sea ice each year since 1979. Now that's, I know that that's just a number, that's just a square mile, but it's almost the same size as, the whole state of North Dakota or Ireland, um, just that itself is staggering the, the volume, the, um, the scale of this um, impacts are in crazy uh, that we should be looking at. 
um, the IPCC sixth assessment report that came out in um, recently has is is predicting that it's not just extreme heat. It's um, all of the uh, in climate indicators that we see. They are extreme to begin with, but they are also getting to be more frequent and also getting to be more intense. So we have to look at the indicator, but we also look at how more frequently are we going to see that. And what does that do to us? Um, the economy um, beyond just the, the, the what it causes to the communities, the amount of impact that that's having on our e economy is un unimaginable. What we thought it would be, it's actually six times higher than what we pre previously had predicted. Um, our GDP, 4% GDP loss is predicted if we stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's just the surface warming temperature that everyone has been talking about, that we have to hit the 1.5, but now we are anticipating that to be much higher. If we go to 2 degrees Celsius, it's, it's 11% GDP loss. So that's the kind of economic stress we are talking about. These are 22 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters just in the year 2020. The scale of this is phenomenal. Um, th there are insurance agencies that are refusing to insure any of these, uh, the impacts of these disasters on properties anymore. This is how frequent they are getting and how expensive they are getting. And I work a lot in the education sector, and this is the reason I do. I do have kids, but it's so unfortunate that people that are born in 2020 will witness 4.7 times more climate hazards during their lifetime as compared to a person born in 1965. Just how can we ignore this, right? How can we not do something for these the, this generation? But again, I talked about lots of um, doom and gloom because we have to for resilience, but it was a lot of the what was what I was talking about was environmental. What we can't forget is climate change is critical, but it's really not the only thing that we should be talking about when we talk about resilience. It's just one third of the bigger picture. What truly resilience should be a flexible framework that helps us achieve resilience that considers social, economic, and environmental resilience. We have to look at that all the three aspects before we think we before we can consider a strategy, a true strategy. We need to be looking at um, all aspects of a solution. Why would we do that? Is because if you look at this graph or uh, this diagram right here, um, health overall physical health gets impacted by many, many factors. Social economic factors actually take 40% of that chunk, physical environment 10%, health behaviors 30 So we have to, again, look at every aspect of a um, community to consider what is a good resilient solution for that community. And that is why Perkins and Will came up with a tool called Proceed. Um, and uh, it is readily available. Um, th that's the link to it. And what we are, um, what this tool is, uh, the, the full form of Proceed is public repository to engage community and enhance design equity. What the tool allows us to do is look at a certain address and look at all the vulnerabilities associated with that address. Now, when I talk about vulnerabilities, I'm talking about all um, aspects of it. Again, what kind of stresses that the community is facing, what kind of exposures the community is facing, and what kind of demographics are part of that community? Um, what, um, what kind of education does the community have? What kind of uh, rent burdens are they seeing? Uh, food insecurities. Uh, what kind of health risks, and we are doing, we are for, we are looking at this in our projects, and then we can see what all aspects, and not just the environmental aspects, but the social and economic aspects of the community, so we, we can design for it. 
But coming back to uh, looking at risks, these are some examples of how we um, we rank the risks, and um, in that in doing so, we can see which ones are the, going to be our biggest priorities. Um, so we look at risk as classification from negligible to extreme, and then we look at what are um, what should be the immediate reactions. What should we be doing at a minimum to make sure the higher classifications are taken care of. Um, these, uh, this is another, um, I, I love seeing this because it shows you that we should be looking at risk, both in, again, the likelihood of the risk happening and the consequence that it leads to. Uh, by adaptation strategies, we can bring the consequence down so that we are not in at such high risk, but we can bring it down to a medium risk. Or, or further down. So all of our adaptation strategies should be looked at in that realm. So uh, Perkinson Well also has, uh, we have a resilience workbook that we want every project to follow. And the strategies or the questions that we wanna ask in the workbook are filtered under these three different parts. So we talk about risk assessment first, then we talk about adaptation uh, to climate change, and then we look at whether um, a site or a project that we are working on is suitable for a shelter in place. And the workbook is intended to be used on all the projects. So we try and um, at the early stages of a project, try and figure out what are the climate impacts. And if you look at this, no longer are we looking at climate impacts that might be, um, or the weather, uh, what kind of impact that we're gonna see within 10 years, within 20 years, we would like to project all the way out to as far as we can so that we can strategize solutions that can help us all the way um, for the entirety of our building's lifespan. What are the conventional risks? We look at that um, and the columns in between, we look at whether it's an interiors only project, a building project or a site project and look at what are those conventional risks when it comes to all of those kind of project types. Uh, then we look at what are the adaptation um, um, strategies are, uh, is this um, site going to actually have hazard prep preparedness? Are we going to be um, looking at storing food and water for the occupants, but potentially for the community as well? Or is it is this project suitable to be the shelter in place? Is this walkable? Is this uh, can this be reached um, via a um, bike or a, or a public transport? Uh, can we does it have a community garden? What kind of things can we implement here so that it can be a community resource? Um, and what kind of strategies should we be following in terms of energy efficiency or water efficiency? materials, flexibility to allow it to be to be able to be resilient. So these are the workbooks that we do um, uh, try and use as tools so that we can ask the right questions. And some of those right questions are, you know, this is just an example. Can we uh, look at flood levels? Are we, what kind of questions should we be, be should we be asking uh, when we know the risks? So is there um, um, higher water levels, how much can we design for that 500 year flood plain? Um, and these are things that we need to be asking early on so that we can help our projects prepare better and design for them. And um, there is a term being used, a resilient hub, um, which resilience hub, which um, is a very, very, uh, being used in multiple different ways. And uh, a Resilience Hub primarily is a community focused physical facility that offers day to day services and support the community before, during, and after a disaster. And we can look at Resilience Hubs in multiple ways, though. This is, this is talking about that's the term that is commonly used. But are we only talking about it during a disaster or can it be a resilient hub for a community, not just during an event? Can it be actually truly useful for the community to be resilient in, in times of other social stresses as well? And City of Austin has been doing a great, 
great work with resilient hubs, and that's actually a diagram from the city of Austin's um, or, uh, resilience hub. Uh, what what that might look like? How um, should a resilient hub, resilience hub work? So definitely, um, this is something that would really help the communities if we can identify resilience hubs in multiple ways. Um, very quick, we don't have to go all the way uh, to make um, resilience hubs. We can do smaller strategies to, that can be implemented on projects. So these are very quick project examples. You can see storm, uh, rainwater management, stormwater management in this project in Minnesota. Um, again, very um, bioretention um, and uh, native plants were used for stormwater here. So we're bringing back to nature, which is the best way of implementing resilient strategies. And uh, we this, this project in Boston was the first project that raised their elevation uh, of, uh, for to respond to sea level rise in the future. And very simple strategies you can see on the right side, uh, this is a school project where a, a food service window was uh, implemented on the outdoor, uh, not just for the school population, but to be able to serve the community uh, in, in need. And then this is a project from another um, firm, but uh, it is it had CTE programs uh, implemented that also made the community resilient by giving it the workforce, but also incorporated efficiency measures and uh, renewables to make uh, the building efficient as well. But um, last uh, piece uh, that I will um, mention here. A lot of the rating systems are understanding how important resiliency is. And if you are aware, LEED version 4 is in its public comment right now. And it's actually asking um, for prerequisites now related to resiliency. So there is prerequisite that is climate just assessment. Let's do climate resiliency assessment. Uh, but then also another prerequisite that they have added is resilient site design. Uh, there are other credits that um, watch um, are asking for resilient strategies, but there are prerequisites being added because of how important this um, designing for it is now. And then there are sustainable sites that uh, rating system that covers a lot of the resiliency goals. And PEER, if you're not aware, but PEER is another rating system for utilities. And PEER is actually also um, has a lot of goals that they are setting up for resiliency. I think that's um, that was it from my end, and I will hand it over to Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Awesome. Well, thank you, Shivani, for that wonderful presentation. Yeah. I uh, appreciate you, you know, touching on the doom and gloom a bit <laughs> because it's it's unfortunately necessary, but. Um, for also providing positive solutions and tools like the um, proceed plan and resilience hubs. So thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is Justice Jones. I'm going to ask him to go ahead and come to the stage now while I read your bio. Justice is on a mission to realign human culture with the fire environments we live in and are inextricably connected to. He divides his time between burning things and trying to keep others or other things from burning. In his current role, Justice serves as a wildfire mitigation officer for the Austin Fire Department's Wildfire Division, where he has helped lead Austin and the surrounding area to embrace wildfire preparedness and become rapidly fire adapted. Most recently, Austin became the largest municipality in the country to adopt the ICC Wildland Urban Interface Code, ensuring sustainable wildfire resilience is built to Austin's future. Before joining AFD, Justice served as the Texas A&M Forest Service State Wildland Urban Interface and Prevention Coordinator, where he assisted communities across the state of Texas in enhancing their resilience to wildfires. In addition to his work locally, he also serves on multiple committees, including the International Association of Fire Chiefs Wildland Fire Policy Committee, the National Fire Protection Association's Technical Committee 1140, is a member of the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network and is a technical specialist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So without further ado, please take it away, Justice. Thank you, Kaylin. Welcome. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Um, I'm really excited to be here with everyone today. Um, such great information that's being shared and um, 
Um, wildfire is an important component of our overall resiliency in the city of Austin. Um, as mentioned, I'm a member of the Austin Fire Department, but I also serve as the city's uh, wildfire mitigation officer. So I support other departments and cooperators and their efforts to help Austin become more adapted to wildfire and more resilient to those impacts. Um, and uh, along with that effort, I help uh, lead a city county wildfire coalition, the Austin Travis County Wildfire Coalition. Uh, that works to implement our community wildfire protection plan and that outlines our strategies for how collectively we're going to address wildfire risk and i think it's important to frame that effort with some context um, there is a national strategy for wildfire resiliency so so fear not this is being thought of at all levels um, but it really requires the implementation at that local level and we call that the national cohesive wildland fire management strategy I know that's a mouthful, and so I may just shorten that to our cohesive strategy for the remainder of the presentation. But that cohesive strategy outlines as a nation how we're going to navigate um, these increasingly perilous times related to wildfire. And it calls for communities to become fire adapted. That means they can experience wildfire without significant losses of life and property. I mean, that's certainly our goal here in Austin, um, that our ecosystems and our green infrastructure is resilient to the impacts of wildfire and we can experience a wildfire and bounce back uh, quickly. The majority of the ecosystems in Texas are adapted and have evolved with fire. In fact, we have more fire adapted ecosystems in our state than almost anywhere in the world. And so Texas is a fire dependent state, uh, which means that if we're going to be compatible with this fire environment, that it makes sense to be fire adapted to human beings. Um, the third Justice, I'm sorry for cutting you off. I cannot see your screen. Let's see. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I certainly want to share that. I'm just going to try to reshare. Okay, sure. And if not, we can have uh, Nick maybe share it on your behalf. Okay, I'm seeing it now. Okay, great. And I haven't uh, transitioned slides, so you didn't really miss anything. Perfect. I'm just going to try to get back to the expanded view. Okay, well, I can't see my slides, but as long as y'all can, I think we can power through. Um, is that the case? Everybody can see my slides? I can see it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. All right, uh, so with that, apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I was mentioning the National Cohesive Wildfire Strategy and uh, the elements of that strategy, um, the third of which is an effective um, and efficient response to wildfire, a risk-based response, which means we'll risk a lot to save a lot. Um, but our priority in the fire department and in all the fire services is life safety first. Um, and so we'll talk about why that's uh, so important to us that uh, people take wildfire serious because it is a threat to life safety of our residents and visitors. Um, and part of that understanding of why this is so important um, starts with an understanding of Austin's wildfire risk. Um, if you weren't aware, uh, we have significant wildfire potential in Austin. Uh, some of that was realized in the 2011 fire seasons. We had fires burning into the city of Austin causing uh, wildland urban interface losses. Um, and those are driven by our underlying risk. And the way that we calculate risk is based on a couple of factors. Um, the topography is a really important factor that drives and intensifies fire behavior. The vegetation type can determine the type of fire we're gonna experience. So in uh, East Austin, we see fast moving grass fires. In West Austin, we see more frequent high intensity forest fires, your traditional forest fires. So understanding our fire environment is really important to applying solutions because uh, they have to be unique to the setting. Uh, we have over 91,000 structures identified in Austin as high risk. Um, there's about 250,000 statewide, and so um, fortunately we lead the state in the number of homes that are at risk from wildfire. And part of that is because our land use and development patterns in the past haven't been um, taking wildfire into consideration. Um, that's changed, and we're going to talk about that a little bit as we move forward. Um, but that underlying risk is there. Uh, according to some statistics, um, we are the most at-risk uh, community um, for potential economic losses outside of California. 
Um, so that should be a big indicator of um, just uh, how serious this issue is. I've added a link to our wildfire hub where you can find a lot of the information I'm talking about today, including a map that you can enter your address or your facility's address in to understand what the wildfire risk in Austin is. Um, but the nature of our fire environment is that we're going to experience region-wide wildfires when seasons do occur. That means um, suppression resources are taxed to their limit because um, our traditional models of relying on each other for assistance, if there's like an individual structure fire, goes out the window when everybody's having a wildfire all at once. Um, that leads to more exposures than we have resources to protect those exposures. And so on those days, like 2011, where the fire departments are tapped out, fires are left to burn on their own. And then it really comes down to what has been done on the ground before that fire occurred to mitigate those impacts, which is why we don't rely solely on a suppression based approach. Uh, we, we understand that it takes a community to prepare for wildfire. And so our uh, job in the Austin Fire Department is to help our department and our partners understand their important role. And, Keep our community resilient from those impacts. So what does preparing for wildfire look like? That means um, everyone understands the risk and the impact to their values, uh, regardless of the orientation they're coming from. And so if you live in a high rise in downtown Austin, but you enjoy um, our open space and green belts, well, you have a stake in wildfire. So a big part of our job is helping people understand um, how they fit into this equation. For example, if you're a city planner and in the past um, subdivisions have been de designed without multiple ingress and egress, um, that's the past. But moving forward, we have to be uh, responsible for the decisions that we're making and the consequences. And so uh, changing the way that we're doing things based on this understanding of risk is one of our strategies. And so uh, if you don't understand your role in wildfire adaptation, get with me after the presentation and I'll help you uh, define that. It also means that we have personal responsibilities at the homeowner, the resident, and the visitor level that they understand the fire environment that they're in. And that's a big part of our job is to help educate the public of the situation so they can um, take meaningful and appropriate action to mitigate that. We use a program called Ready, Set, Go. Ready meaning you have prepared your property to survive wildfire. You've prepared your family and loved ones. Um, everyone knows that the evacuation plan is in place and how to follow that plan. Um, and that you heed the evacuation orders when they're given because it's during this evacuation phase that we're seeing the majority of our fatalities associated with wildfire. Um, and then it takes um, community wide actions, uh, really a community a based approach is the best approach for preparing for wildfire. Each individual in the community that prepares increases the safety of that community. But because our development patterns lead to structures being uh, really close proximity to one another in many areas, um, that increases our potential for an urban conflagration. And so our communities really are in this together. Um, Austin leads the state in the number of nationally recognized FireWise USA sites, and that means um, communities at a grass level are owning their wildfire risk, they're understanding it, they're developing plans to take action to increase the resilience of their, of their community, and they're implementing those plans with support from us and other departments and agencies across the fire landscape. Um, and then it leads to uh, what is Austin's role in becoming fire-adapted communities. That really means for us is that each of us recognize and understand how we impact wildfire or don't, um, how we can implement best practices to ensure that um, our resiliency is increased by our presence, um, and that we take ownership of um, the ways that wildfire can impact communities based on our decisions. Um, that, that gets back to us having the personal responsibility of recognizing um, the cascading effects of decisions. Uh, that are made on the landscape. Very often, well-intended decisions could have unintended consequences. Uh, so we work really closely with departments across the city of Austin to help them understand um, how efforts uh, relate to wildfire risk. And so how do we make this change that we're trying to enact at a cultural level a permanent change? Um, one of the ways that we're doing that in Austin is codifying wildfire risk. We went through a process with a, um, a think tank called Headwaters Economics that developed a report for us called Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire. And it outlined all the strategies we could use from a regulatory and a land use standpoint to increase Austin's resiliency. One of those primary recommendations is that we needed a code in place that defined how you can 
build in wildfire prone areas in a way that's compatible with that environment. And that code is the wildland urban interface code. Austin was the largest municipality anywhere to have adopted this code. And we went beyond the base code to add additional measures for protection from embers because embers are the number one reason we're losing homes across the landscape. Um, they get into nooks and crannies and attics and very often burn homes from the inside out. And so we wanted to make sure that future development in Austin was done with fire adaptation and resiliency in mind. So when people move into homes, um, they're safer from the start. And then it's just their job to maintain that safe environment and their situational awareness. So our current code um, says if you live in a wildland urban interface area, and those are defined uh, through our wildfire uh, overlay, that you have to do certain things to harden your structure, like have windows that are ignition resistant, meaning they don't fracture as easily. A single pane window fractures at about 187 degrees. Uh, when it's 110 outside, it doesn't take that much more heat to cause a window to fail, and then you have access by embers. It requires screening for ember intrusion into the attics and um, under decks. Um, and it requires the material directly adjacent to wildland areas be resistant to ignition, because uh, that's our overall overarching goal. We want Austin to be ignition resistant. Um, we are adopting the 2024 code, which will get us up to par with other city codes. Um, it'll also give us an opportunity to look at ways we can improve the code. And one of those areas that we're considering is a zero to five zone around the perimeter of the structure uh, that's prohibitive of combustible materials. This is excluding protected trees and heritage trees, but the fine flashy fuels like bark mulch and um, pompous grass that easily ignite during wildfires or can burn um, and go unnoticed by firefighters later to ignite structures. So as we move forward, we want to improve this code um, by integrating the best science available. And the best science says that zero to five non-combustible zone gives your home the greatest chance of surviving um, that wildfire and is being applied across the wildfire landscape. In addition, um, we're seeing indirect impacts to homeowners that's a threat to their ability to maintain um, their ability to occupy structures. Um, what we're seeing across the landscape, especially in Western states and in Florida, is insurance companies are leaving these areas um, because of perils like wildfire, flooding, and, and other issues. In Texas, our two top perils um, are wind and hail, but wildfires quickly catching up. Uh, we have uh, members of our community contacting us every day that they've received letters that are either resulting in cancellations of insurance, uh, traumatic increases in uh, premiums, um, or inability to renew and find insurance at all, which translates uh, for many people, if you can't have insurance, you can't have your mortgage. Um, and so we're developing a strategy to help protect people in place and help them keep their insurance in place so they can keep their home. So we don't have people losing homes to wildfire indirectly, um, not even by the actual wildfire, but by um, economic aspects of wildfire that are um, impacting our community. Uh, the way that wildfire resiliency is being re um, appro approached by the insurance industry is they do not have a uniform way that they measure wildfire risk. There's organizations that are trying to cha change that, like the Institute of Business and Home Safety. Uh, they've developed a program called Wildfire Prepared Homes um, that allows insurance agencies to have confidence that they're taking a consistent approach to mitigation measures. Um, but like I said, they're not just looking at wildfire, they're looking at other perils um, and the cumulative impacts of those perils are resulting in states like California largely becoming uninsurable in these high risk areas. Um, and it's creating um, essentially wildfire refugees that are moving to other states that are lower risk and have greater insurability. Um, the insurance industry has been losing money on wildfires over the last five years, a significant amount of losses. And so as a business entity, they're doing the math to understand how they can stay afloat. Um, and in some of the states across the country, it's not making sense anymore to remain present. State Farm just canceled uh, 72,000 policies in California. We have over 35,000 State Farm policies in Texas. So we know that if that comes to us, it's going to have a major uh, impact. We've been rated by CoreLogic, one of the risk actuaries for the insurance industry. Um, it's now the seventh highest potential economic recovery cost in the nation outside of California. 
so we have a real significant potential for losses, but not just direct losses, secondary economic losses associated with wildfire. The average cost of suppression of a major wildfire is about 2% of the overall impacts. That means um, when the fire's out and those secondary impacts come like flooding and loss of property tax, those all fall to the local community. So 98% of the cost of wildfires are kind of fall back on Austin, even if we get help from state and federal agencies to fight that wildfire um, at a very high reconstruction cost of upwards of $40 billion if we're to see significant landscape scale losses. So certainly an alarming environment. So what is the future of um, Austin if we do not become more resilient to the impacts of wildfire? Uh, we're gonna continue to see increased impacts, occurrence, duration, and severity of these wildfires. Um, the burning seasons are increasingly longer. And so the terms fire season are going out the window and we're experiencing fire years. Uh, we have potential for major loss of life and property. Austin has 300 and Travis County has 339 subdivisions that have limited ingress and egress. That means areas of potential entrapment um, that we have major concern about. Um, and moving forward, we don't allow subdivisions to be designed like that, um, but we still have a built environment that's at high risk. We're seeing a tremendous increase in smoke related illnesses, uh, up to a 72% increase in EMS runs during these wildfire events. And the fire doesn't even have to be in your community. It can uh, travel long distances and still have those smoke related impacts. So we're helping to prepare our community for embracing for those impacts. We've worked with uh, UT to develop a smoke uh, warning model uh, so we can notify residents when they're in the path of harmful smoke. Uh, some of the homes that are impacted by wildfire smoke are having to be destroyed because of the toxicity of um, houses and forest fires burning. Um, we mentioned the housing insurability and affordability crisis. Uh, this is looming uh, all across the country. New Mexico, Colorado, Washington, Oregon are all um, feeling um, the, the insurance companies leaving that landscape. California is having to regulate them to stay in place, although that's only a short term fix. And then we see these long term impacts like environmental degradation, loss of our water quality um, and, and quantity, loss of critical habitat. Austin has uh, a number of endangered and threatened species that can be impacted by wildfire if we um, aren't being proactive in implementing that national cohesive strategy as we are. So what's the future of Austin if we become more resilient? we'll have better wildfire outcomes. And we've seen across uh, other communities in the country that if they'll prepare for wildfires, if they'll acknowledge the potential for their destruction, they're less likely to face that as an outcome. Um, that we can have fire adapted human communities, um, humans that recognize that we're part of our natural ecosystems and that um, the 90% of the fires that do occur are caused by us and thus we need to be responsible. Um, uh, stewards of those ecosystems and enhance those ecosystems resiliency through activities like prescribed burning or appropriate vegetation and invasive species management. So when we do have wildfire, which is inevitable that our ecosystems are able to bounce back. Uh, the pinnacle fire that happened in 2011 at Oak Hill was a stand replacing fire. Um, there's apartments now, but if you went back there after the fire, it was almost bereft of vegetation because of the severity intensity of that fire. That can happen in lots of places across Austin. So we wanna enhance the resilience of our ecosystems. We want people to be less fearful and more empowered. Uh, we want them to be able to enjoy this great uh, city and county that we live in, um, but they're having a hard time doing that, not understanding how to be safe. And so by empowering people, we're lowering their fear, we're lowering their climate anxiety and we're giving them tools they can use because we do believe that we can be resilient to the impacts of wildfire in fact it's one of the changes from a climatic standpoint that we have the most control over and so we want our population to be healthier happier to be able to um, enjoy our environment um, and not worry about wildfire because they understand their role in our fire adapted communities and how they fit um, and we want to ensure that we have a strong economy uh, communities that have been impacted by smoke are experiencing extreme um, catastrophic economic loss. The community of Ashland, Oregon, the home of the Shakespeare Festival, um, is dealing with major economic losses due to smoke alone shutting down that, that festival. Um, our equivalent of South by Southwest or um, other events uh, certainly would impact our economy if we're not able to manage these wildfires and bounce back quickly. 
so with that, um, I just like to leave on a hope of optimism that I believe that we can navigate um, these challenges, that we can get to a place of being fire adapted and we can get back to just enjoying the great community that we live in. And with that, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Justice. That was an amazing presentation. I actually um, lived in Oak Hill a few years ago and didn't know about that fire in 2011. So that's pretty eye opening to me. Um, I'm also really excited to check out the wildfire hub and the ready, set, go guide. So thank you. A lot thank of great you. resources. Appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. Our next speaker is Scott Henson. He's already up on the screen. Um, Scott is the chief technology officer at Pecan Street, where he leads the Pecan Street lab and directs research efforts to study the grid and climate impacts for integrated renewable technologies, electric vehicles, and software enabled smart devices that will modernize and decarbonize the electric and transportation sectors. Prior to Pecan Street, Scott worked at a thin film CIGS solar module manufacturer where he led module packing, performance, certification, and reliability efforts. Scott has also worked in the military, medical, consumer, and oil industries developing power supplies, precision measurement equipment, and inductive heating technologies. Scott received his BSEE from the University of Texas in Austin with undergraduate specializations in both communication systems and power distribution. Scott was awarded the 2015 Outstanding Engineering Award for Transforming the World's Understanding of Consumer and Community Electric Usage by the IEEE, IEEE Power Engineering Society of Central Texas Chapter. He is also a contributing author to Transmission and Distribution World Magazine. Without further ado, take it away, Scott. Thank you. I'm having trouble hearing you, Scott. I don't know if it's on, just on my end. You're muted. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Somehow my audio input got switched uh, to one of the other four or five. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, let's head to the next slide. Um, for those of you that don't know about Pecan Street, we are a 501c3 based here in Austin, Texas. We got started about 13 years ago. Um, uh, 14 years ago now, I guess, um, I've worked Pecan Street now for like 12 years. Um, and what we do is we put instrumentation in folks homes behind the meter. And that can be the electricity meter or the water meter or the natural gas. Um, what, whatever, whatever we're trying to measure, we go in behind the meter. Uh, and we are trying to get higher resolution data to understand how people are using and producing electricity or using natural gas, using water to understand uh, uh, interventions that we can make. We then take uh, these homes and we sort of cluster them together. Uh, we got started in Austin, as I mentioned, uh, that is where our largest group of homes is, but we are now in um, a number of states in Puerto Rico uh, and, and have uh, test beds uh, all over the country. Um, uh, our, and I have an example of our data that we collect uh, on the next slide, but we'll, we won't go there quite yet. Uh, at this point, I can't keep this slide up to date. We are expanding fast enough where every time I make this slide, it becomes out of date. I think we're up to 14 billion records added daily uh, from our data collection network. Uh, that university sponsored researchers is probably still about right. Uh, that once that number hit hit about 2000 sort of stabilized because what happens is people graduate uh, and move on into the uh, uh, industry and, and, and things like that and, and they and they drop off uh, the papers uh, that is uh, also out of date. Uh, that's um, a fair bit higher than that now. Uh, and then um, and so what we and, and that that academic access is highly subsidized. So there's a small sample set of, of homes and data that we actually give away for free. Uh, to academic researchers uh, for unfunded research. So there's 
uh, quite a few masters and PhD theses that have been uh, based and defended on our data uh, for those sorts of uh, things. Um, and then we also have a testing lab here. Uh, we are in the Miller neighborhood, uh, not too far away from where Austin Energy has moved their headquarters. Um, and we do a lot of uh, concept and prototype testing for things that we've designed, either for some of these um, instrumentation uh, or data collection systems or for um, others that come to us and say, hey, um, uh, we need this uh, tested to make sure that it works the way we think it does. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So, as I mentioned, we started in Texas um, uh, and we are expanding uh, and have expanded uh, that uh, by the end of 2027, we think that our largest column here uh, and our largest state will actually be Pennsylvania, uh, not Pennsylvania, Delaware. Uh, we were awarded for negotiation or selected for negotiation for a GRIP round one award. Uh, that may add up to 2,000 homes for us in Delaware. So we're very excited about kicking that project off. We're still in the award negotiation uh, uh, phase for that, uh, but we're hoping to be able to kick that one off soon. Um, through a grant from the Sloan Foundation, we were able to expand into uh, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, and Georgia. Um, and those uh, test beds are coming online as we speak. Uh, there, uh, I see a constant uh, uh, chatter on Slack about homes that get added in Oklahoma and things like that. What we've done here is we are trying to add economic diversity uh, to our data set um, uh, and uh, um, uh, climate diversity to our data set. So when we were in Austin, uh, a lot of times we would um, incentivize folks to to volunteer with us uh, by at offering additional rebates on solar uh, or plug-in electric vehicles uh, for our existing homes in Delaware. That was part of a DOE grant where we were studying um, uh, demand response functionality for air conditioners uh, and things like that. Um, and so the homes that, that a lot of those grants sort of funded to, to bring online um, were early adopters. Um, and, and what I would say is that basically those homes tell us sort of how engineers, doctors, lawyers use data uh, and leave us uh, leave a, a, a gap. And, and, and we knew about it, but we just couldn't do anything about it at the time until Sloan Foundation very generously uh, provided some funding. Uh, it, it didn't really help us understand uh, the energy usage patterns of, of somebody that might be uh, suffering from energy burden. Right. Um, uh, so. Uh, when we when we expanded into Michigan, uh, Georgia, Oklahoma, um, Oregon, Pennsylvania, uh, that was a um, an emphasis for us to recruit from from uh, uh, LMI communities and, and communities of color, so that we have a better understanding. And it is it is a fairly different uh, energy profile, right? Go ahead, next slide. So why do we collect this data? Because we want to understand better uh, how people, as I mentioned, are using and or producing energy. Um, and we can't get the type of information that we want with meter data that utilities use uh, for billing and system operation purposes, right? So uh, uh, many areas of the country, they all actually do 15 minute reads. Uh, the graph here on the top is hourly data for a home. Um, uh, that is also a fairly common meter um, uh, reading interval for a smart meter, electricity smart meter. Uh, our data, an example of it is on the bottom, and this is our one minute data. And so every single one of those colors is labeled there and it shows the different things um, uh, uh, turning on and off in the house. And you can see how dynamic that residential electrical load is as things turn on and off and as uh, cloud cover moves through the, the area. We actually turn on our uh, energy monitoring systems to one second interval. So, um, uh, uh, and I don't actually have a, uh, an example graph of that because when you deal with that much data, uh, it's actually, uh, it starts to get difficult to plot uh, and things like that. But but the reason we turned on uh, the data collection to one second is because it informs a lot of design work around um, inverter based systems, uh, microgrid design, handling inrush current and things like that. Um, uh, and instead of getting just real power, which is typically what uh, what um, uh, electric utilities get from their residential electric meters, um, we get real power. 
a parent power, current RMS, phase angle between voltage and current, current THD, and um, uh, voltage and frequency at the at the uh, input to the home. And so when you when you're starting to collect, you know, one second information on all that, that means that we have individual homes that. that um, uh, generate 15, 16 million data points a day, and that's how we can get to that 16, uh, uh, 14 to 16 billion data points. Uh, by the time Delaware comes online, we'll probably be at 30 billion um, data points um, a day uh, when that when that program is finished. So that's a uh, by data we would be an absolutely gigantic utility if we were one, but we are not. Um, so, uh, what does like you know? When, when you have access to this much uh, information, one of the things that I've had to sort of uh, learn to not do over the years is to ask so many questions and do so much research that I never never come up for air. You could you could dig yourself a rabbit hole uh, where nobody could get you out of it. Um, uh, but uh, it does provide uh, a tremendous uh, um, uh, background for learning. It provides a tremendous background for us to make interventions and see how effective they were. Uh, so why don't we move to the next slide? So um, uh, to keep on topic for energy efficiency for uh, climate change um, uh, and things like that, this is uh, some um, uh, data that we took for just just our Austin homes. So this is uh, uh, you know what Austin Energy is um uh dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis uh and we compared two days right so the ashray design tables for austin um depending on exactly which version vintage you use um uh shows you know an average maximum high temperature in the day in the summer to be 97 99 100 degrees uh, it, you know, there's some probabilistic uh, determination on some of these things, but, um, you know, um, we, we saw the, the news articles last summer, uh, the coldest summer we will have had in a long time was last summer and they're just going to get hotter from here on out uh, for a while. Uh, and, and for us, this, this is an extreme challenge or, or something that we are looking at and sort of worried about for. Uh, integrating renewable energy onto the grid, because one of the things that you need to be able to do to integrate higher and higher levels of renewable energy is to have some amount of load shifting, uh, demand shifting, so that you can um, uh, get load to follow generation. Uh, gone are going to be the days where uh, you just uh, use the regulators on on uh, um, inertial slash thermal based generation and just start pouring more in from centralized generation, right? We have to have a grid that is going to accommodate distributed generation. That distributed generation is going to be intermittent. It is not going to necessarily follow the load. Uh, and we need a number of technologies on either end, um, you know, batteries on the generation side to help um, uh, smooth things over and, and ride through uh, uh, valleys in, in, in generation. And on the demand side, technologies that allow us to shift that load around. And one of the concerns that we have is, is that as we get hotter, uh, and uh, if we are not good about our energy efficiency programs, we're going to have a real challenge shifting that load around. So um, you can see how much more energy uh, it gets used. Uh, uh, and this is, as, as I said, we are not, when we do this, we are looking directly at the HVAC circuits. We're not looking at the rest of the, the home load. So we have pulled out and we are directly measuring those HVAC circuits. And uh, between the hours of 2 to 8 p.m., you know, those hours between uh, 3 and 5 or 4 and 6 um, are so critical for, for four CP events in, in the state of Texas. Um, you see 50% uh, more energy being used uh, just because of the temperature of uh, the day. Those air conditioners are designed basically to, to move heat from indoors to outdoors. And as it gets hotter and hotter outdoors, they don't really have a good place to put it. Uh, that's a very simplistic way of describing it. I said that one time for a, uh, a local television news station in the reporter's eyes. I was like, as soon as I said it, I knew that that was going to get used. That that little sound bite was going to get used because her eyes went wide. It's like, ooh, that's a good one. It's like, all right, that's getting used. And sure enough, my 30 second sound bite for fame, that was what it was. Um, but you can see how much more energy is getting used, and it, and it's a nonlinear effect. What ends up happening is is that the air conditioner starts cycling more frequently, um, or even in, in a in a home with a poor envelope, it turns on and never turns off, which you desperately don't want to see. Uh, it has lost that home at that point. Um, 
And, and not only that, but the power consumption of the air conditioning unit goes up, even though a uh, traditional air conditioning unit, non multiple stage, non uh, variable speed drive compressor is supposed to be a bang, bang, you know, on off kind of uh, a thing. Um, as the temperature rises, uh, it, it, the, the, the thermochemical reactions are such that it, it, it starts to use more power. And so you see this, this um, uh, energy demand sort of take off. Uh, this particular day, uh, you can see the dotted line in this chart. Uh, we can see in our data the effects of a uh, Austin Energy um, rush hour event. Uh, that's that little scoop um, uh, taken out of it. You can see where it would have been had there not been one. Um, but we could see that in this 150 homes. We don't know for sure how many of these homes um, uh, are uh, in uh, the rush hour program. Uh, we can make a really good guess based on the data if the air conditioner doesn't turn on during that window, right? But we also don't know if that somebody, uh, if there was some sort of uh, efficiency or action alert and somebody actually, you know, turned the air conditioner off manually. So we, we don't know for sure, but we have a pretty good idea, right? But the, the takeaway here is, is even with that uh, rush hour program, that impact doesn't get you anywhere near the original uh, uh, power demand for that day, right? It is it is significantly higher and it doesn't get you close. So, so that level of demand response uh, isn't going to uh, uh, get back to what is the significantly easier um, uh, uh, power load for these air conditioners. And that's why, why one of the reasons why energy efficient is so critical. Go to the next slide, please. Whoop. Oh, we'll get it. We'll get it. There we go. All right. Thank you. Um, I've done that so many times go flying right on through. Um, uh, so, uh, we took another very, very, very hot day and knowing our homes, uh, that we have in Austin, we sort of divided them into two groups, right? We, we divided them into a, uh, less energy efficient home, uh, group and a more energy efficient home group. Um, and you can see based on just the efficiency of the home, the, the home envelope, how much that actually helps you in a watt per square foot basis, right? It's substantial, the, the area under the curve. You can see uh, a lot of evidence, even though this is a 10 home sample, that those 10 inefficient homes, um, those poor folks, and I'm frankly, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I moved into uh, my house uh, in, the, in the late 90s. The, the front part of the house was built in 1926. The back part of the house was added onto. Uh, it's a mixture of, of ages and construction standards and technologies. I may be one of these less efficient homes, right? I see this behavior in my own home where the air conditioner turns on in the afternoon and just can't cycle off because it cannot get enough heat out of the home to hit the set point temperature. Um, if you have a home like this, that home is unavailable for demand response. If you turn the air conditioner off, I have never signed up for, um, and I am I am guilty of sin for this. I have never signed up for rush hour because it would be such such a miserable event for me. I'd be opting out of it all the time. Uh, and so, so you see these homes uh, get to be, you know, if I, if we lose power. Uh, my home goes from, and my set point's only 80 degrees. My home will go from 80 to 95 in, in half an hour. And so it is, it is obviously a, a leaky envelope. There's only so much I can do to do about it. Right. Um, but when you have energy efficiency, now you can cycle these air conditioners. You can hold them off for a little while. You can do demand response and you don't lose the home. The home can recover the, the, the homeowners are willing to participate because they are not. Uh, frankly, stupidly uncomfortable in their own homes, just sweating like crazy, right? So this is this is you know, Texas is is behind as a state. Austin does a great job with its uh, energy efficiency standards, but Texas as a state is is fairly lax in its energy efficiency standards, and we don't actually meet a lot of the energy efficiency standards that we set for ourselves as a state. And so uh, this is one of the ways that you know we are thinking that that we can. Um, get out of some of this uh, uh, struggle that we're in, in terms of uh, uh, being able to provide enough energy. Uh, next slide. 
On the flip side of things, our data is telling us that EVs are criminally underutilized for, for services. Now, again, this is sort of a smaller number of homes. Uh, we took a day where there was a conservation appeal. And frankly, from this graph, I, I cannot tell you for sure if there's a dip in charging because of the energy conservation appeal from ERCOT um, uh, or not. Um, it is too small of a sample size to do it. Uh, if it if there was conservation by these uh, EV um, uh, owners, it was not an automated system. It was the homeowners going out there and and making sure that the car wasn't plugged in or the car wasn't charging. Right. Um, uh, but our data has shown over the years that um, you know one of the when I first got started, I, I can't tell you how many times I had utility folks come to me and saying, "Oh my gosh, we're worried about electric vehicles coming home and everybody plugging in at five p.m. and all the vehicles charging at the same time, and then and that demand." We don't see that. We've we've looked at hundreds of thousands of charging events over the years, and we just don't see that pattern. The pattern that we do see is that people want their vehicles to be charged to leave for work. So I can't tell you when a vehicle is going to be charging because the 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 distribution is frankly so even over the course of the day for for a very large set of homes, uh, but I can tell you is is that uh, they will not be charging between six thirty and seven thirty a.m. What we also see is that fifty percent of the charge events um, that we we monitor are less than six kilowatt hours um, uh, or four kilowatt hours, like like seventy percent of them are less than six kilowatt hours, and and if your charge rate is somewhere in that three to 10 kilowatt range. That means that you charge, these folks are charging for a very short period of time. And they have a lot of flexibility of when they could charge. Go ahead and to the next slide. Um, and so um, uh, what that means is that the electric vehicle for um, uh, a residential electric vehicle is the most flexible load we have ever put into a home and and second place load in terms of flexibility is is not even close. Um, you've got 23 hours of the day to get a 30 minute to one hour charge event done. And so um, uh, uh, even if you even if you are only, um, looking at nighttime charging, which we know those cars are present um, a lot of times during the day. Uh, but even if you're only looking at nighttime charging, you still have eight or nine hours to get that charge done. You have tremendous flexibility. You add um, controlled workplace charging uh, and, and controlled uh, public charging, and all of a sudden you have uh, an awful lot of flexibility. And when we look at it, and all we did for this was um, to look at uh, wholesale electricity prices. So this is not something necessarily that the homeowner would see because they're not exposed to these rates, especially in the Austin Energy Service Territory, but they're not exposed to these rates, but we, we didn't have it. So we, we basically used wholesale pricing as a proxy because we didn't have an, another choice, right? Um, but it can mean a 30% swing in costs for that energy, right? Um, uh, not only that, but it does allow you to, to sort of chase those variable renewable resources. So as wind picks up at night, you can wait for it to become a certain percentage of the grid to go charge that car. And then you, you know that your, your total emissions uh, for that electricity is actually quite low. Um, so I will stop there. Uh, this is my last slide, I believe, right? I don't have another one after this. Uh, and then and when we get to the questions section, I guess at the end, I'd be happy to ha uh, answer any questions. So thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks. Well, thank you, Scott. I remember uh, visiting Pecan Street back in around uh, 2018, I think, and I remember being amazed by your work then. So this update just took it to a whole uh, new level with the organization's expansion. Okay, our next speaker is Valerie Paxton. I'm going to ask her to go ahead and come to the stage now. Valerie is the Environmental Conservation Program Manager for Customer Energy Solutions at Austin Energy. Since 2006, Valerie has worked in the renewable energy industry in Austin with experience in manufacturing, workforce training, project development, and program development. Take it away, Valerie. Hey, thanks. Uh, quick check that my mic is working and that my screen is properly being shared. Your mic's working video. I do not see your screen yet. Telling it to share. Aha, there we go. There we go. Looking good. Okay. Perfect. Thank All right. you. Obstacles cleared. Okay, y'all. 
I am going to try to cover my slides in 10 minutes. Um, so bear with me. Just um, one note, Valerie, I do see your presentation, uh, like the presenter view. The whole, just yeah. Move that okay. over. Let's try that again. Well, and if we don't have the time to get that going more nicely than you guys, uh, let's see, we'll just share the screen. We can do that. Okay, sorry, thanks. It wouldn't be a presentation if we weren't messing with that. All right, okay. better now? It, perfect, thank you. All right, thanks for joining me on this journey. Um, Y'all, thank you so much for coming to this presentation. Uh, I work for Austin Energy and I'm here today to talk about some of our customer program offerings that empower customers to be proactive about resiliency. So as you've heard already today, you know, resiliency involves planning, design, continued vigilance and participation. Um, when our customers choose to participate in our voluntary programs, they can benefit from a uh, reduced bill, uh, reduced footprint. They can potentially earn credits um, or cash incentives with us. And uh, maybe a little known fact, maybe not. They also help reduce year round costs for all Austin Energy customers when they participate in peak events because it reduces our demand from ERCOT. So um, just a, a little intro there. Um, the topics that I'm going to talk today about are primarily demand response. We'll spend a lot of time there. Solar, resiliency as a service, and resiliency hubs, those bottom two. Um, I know we talked a little bit about resiliency hubs already. Um, so some of these you may be familiar with. What is not on this slide, but which I would just be sad if I didn't say, if you have a leaky envelope, um, we have home performance programs uh, to help fix that up. So, um, you know, if you if you heard Scott and you're like, oh, that's me too, why even bother? My house is so leaky. Don't be that way. Please check out our website if you're an Austin Energy customer um, and look at what, uh, what programs we offer uh, to advise. If you may qualify for incentives um, if you have an older home and uh, would like to get that, um, you know, resiliency DR ready. Um, I'm going to start talking about our commercial demand response program. This program has been around for over 10 years in various iterations. Currently, we have almost 700 participants. Um, when you participate, uh, what you're signing up for is uh, we'll reach out to customers uh, for two hour events uh, where we request that they reduce their consumption by about 10%. Uh, these events typically happen between June and September and between the hours of 1 and 7 p.m. Uh, we have two variations of this program. So one is our standard. And with that, uh, the business would get about a 30 minute notice via email or text. Um, and then they would manually reduce their load. Again, we're requesting by about 10 percent, if not more. And on average, you know, they get $50 per kilowatt reduction. We also have a our fast or auto program. And in that case, uh, those customers get 10 minutes notice um, and they earn a little bit more money, $65 uh, per kilowatt on average. Um, types of activities that, that customers can do to reduce that demand um, involve like cycling HVAC or refrigeration, lighting, adjusting the thermostat, um, and potentially even maybe reduced operations uh, during critical events. Um, you have the potential to earn up to $66,000 per year through this program, but you can also opt out of any event. So if it's not for you, uh, can't stress enough, these are voluntary programs. Um, so those are sort of, I did sort of like a quick recap. Oh, so participating, um, if you're interested, I think Rob will drop a link in the slide for who you can contact um, and go through a process of signing up. Uh, so let's let's jump to our next one. Um, so power partner thermostat um, and EV. Uh, the power partner thermostat program, we have about 21,000 participants. Uh, it's also been around for quite a long time. Um, similar sort of program where um, customers are, are expected to respond to two hour events, uh, this time typically between three and six, we make exceptions for holidays. Uh, and that June through September period is most critical for us. Um, in this, we typically adjust the thermostat by four degrees. Um, yeah, there, as Scott mentioned, they're made pre-cool before the event. And then if you have a good uh, insulation going on, it'll keep your house cool for a little bit during our, our peak demand events. 
in this program, there's no notice, um, but anyone can opt out either through an app on their phone or by going to their thermostat and just telling it no. Um, ways to register this uh, through this program, you can do it through your device and, you know, uh, it's Nest, it's beyond Nest. Uh, um, uh, ways to do it, uh, to go in and use that app on your phone. Um, and uh, once you sign up for this event, or sorry, for this program, you can get $50 per device uh, on your bill. And then uh, a new thing we're doing to continuing participation, um, if you're continuing to participate after the installation, then you can get up to $25 per device uh, once a year. Um, oh, and the exciting part about this slide, uh, we're looking at in adding EV charging stations to that as well. So that's something we're hoping to be able to release more information on this year, um, but very much to, to Scott's last uh, or near last slide, um, there is a lot of potential in managing EV charging uh, in a smart way. So we wanna encourage that as well. Oh, that's not gonna work, next slide. So in addition to our, um, our programs that you can enroll in and sign up for, we've also started a behavioral demand response pilot. Uh, in this pilot, we chose 50,000 customers at random and uh, they don't get an incentive, but they do get messages just saying, hey, it's a stressful time for the grid. Would you like to reduce your energy? Um, and we've had, we've had some res good responses there. We're gonna run this program again um, this summer as well. Uh, and just to see what, um, you know, what we can get going on there. So some of you in this audience may, may have been part of this pilot. Um, and of course, everything is optional and you can, uh, can opt out. Uh, how are we doing? 116. Okay. Got to go faster. Um, we want you guys to know we're also, for any of you working in the multifamily space, we are also trying lots of different solutions to help again, reduce, uh, reduce bills and with energy management. Uh, this pilot program that we are running through a Department of Energy grant uh, focuses on water heater and smart thermostats. Uh, residents do earn that bill credit um, to get things signed up. Um, there's a, please uh, email mfrebates at austinenergy.com. Um, and anybody in the multifamily space, yeah, reach out to us, learn more about this program, please. Uh, for time, I'm gonna, I think I have three minutes. Uh, hopefully you all are familiar with solar programs. That's my department. Um, we offer various uh, contoured incentives depending on who the customer is. So residential customers get a flat uh, rebate uh, for installing solar after going through our education program, which helps explain to them what their bill will look like and how to shop for solar. Uh, we also have solar incentives for multifamily property owners and commercial um, uh, property owners as well. Our commercial incentives really run, um, we have a few different programs based on the system size. So not the size of the customer, but the amount of solar being installed. Uh, and we can deliver incentives uh, as a one-time check upfront or as ongoing bill credits. Uh, midway down the slide, you'll also see our value of solar bill credit. So that is an ongoing credit uh, that we do instead of net metering, where every kilowatt hour that gets generated by the solar system gets metered right off the roof, and then we uh, apply that credit to the bill. Um, and then for very large systems on the far right, that's over a megawatt, uh, they get a slightly reduced credit because of um, ERCOT, uh, just being more involved in ERCOT things than that size. Um, and there's the potential for commercial entities to also reduce their demand charge with solar, uh, but that is highly variable and depends on how everything is being managed. Uh, would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the Solar for All grant that we just recently got notification of being awarded. Um, through this grant, we are hoping to install solar and batteries for low-income homes uh, that will help, you know, add to their resiliency during any events. Um, and then, yeah, you are listed benefits here. So we're hoping to um, roll out this program in a way that focuses on workforce development for our Austin businesses. We are really excited about the ability to use federal funds to provide more equitable access to customer-owned on-site solar installations. Um, 
And uh, this, uh, the plan is for some of these solar installations to play in our community solar um, program as well. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Okay, one minute. Uh, and I think I have two slides. So um, another program that we are just getting off the ground is resiliency as a service. Uh, very different from our demand response programs, which do not, uh, which are, are simply about reducing the energy load. Resiliency as a service is actually customer owned generation. Uh, currently, uh, natural gas facilities uh, that would be on site uh, for large commercial customers um, that would be deployed uh, at peak times um, and possibly other times, uh, and we would give them credit for that that local generation. Um, this program is just getting started, so uh, I don't have a link to um, offer to you. Ah, oh, we're 120. Okay, last one, just because it was mentioned before. Um, we are working on resiliency hubs. We currently have four pilot sites that we're working on with PARD. They are currently community centers and um, you know buildings uh, already in existence, and we're looking at adding generators, solar, batteries, uh, and making sure that um, that they can support the community uh, in an event as well. Um, hopefully, we're hoping to get some grip funding as well uh, to help that get this off the ground. Okay, with that, I will turn it over because I think we're at time. Yeah, thank you all. great job with timing, and thank you for sharing about all the programs we have to offer. I'm super excited about the Solar for All grant. Mm -hmm. All right, so now it's time for our Q and A with the speakers. Going to invite all of the speakers up to the stage now. Put your cameras on. We have a little less than 10 minutes, around uh, eight or nine minutes actually for QA. And I am going to direct your attention to my colleague Robert, who will moderate in this discussion. All right. Thank you very much, Caitlin. We do have a few questions. I'm going to start us off with a question for Shivani. It's about Proceed. Uh, is this international or what is the scope of the Proceed um, database that you mentioned? Yeah, great question. Uh, Proceed actually at this point is not international. Uh, it is based. Sorry, I can hear some feedback, um, but it is uh, based on uh, US Census tract data as well as EPA. Uh, so ve uh, very much national at this point, but um, not to say that it might potentially go beyond in the future sometime. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, so the next question is for justice. Um, is there, so the code, if I understand it right, is for new buildings. Is there anything that covers existing buildings in the wild land urban interface? Um, this question is specifically asked about, they have a neighbor who has a wooden house and it's a hundred percent mulched. Um, and they're a smoker. The, this, person is worried about their neighbor lighting their landscaping on fire. Um, unsure if it's actually in the interface, but can you address whether or not it needs to be in the interface for the code to apply? And what about existing buildings? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So the urban wildland interface code was adopted non-retroactively, which means it doesn't apply to existing structure unless they undergo a major retrofit of a, to a certain degree. And then it would trigger the code to be applicable if they're in the wildland urban interface. But I want to make it clear the area that the code covers doesn't cover all of the areas in Austin that are at risk. We had to draw that line somewhere. And so the best way to understand if you are at risk is to visit the Austin wildfire hub and it, in the tab, what's my risk? You can enter your address and it will give you a clear indication of wildfire risk. And that's a good conversation piece to be able to have with your neighbor. It's not, I think you're, we're at risk and, and maybe you should modify your behavior. This map makes it really clear we're at risk. Can we talk about how we could be safer? And if that doesn't work, then um, they can contact us. We're not regulatory, but we do have a strong educational component and, and we're able to work with neighbors to help kind of have those conversations. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, the next one for Valerie, um, there was a question about 
generally about uh, people using their appliances at certain times a day when there may be peak demand. Um, and you mentioned that uh, pilot project that tries to influence uh, customer behavior. Can you just say a few more words about influencing customer behavior? It's not something we can regulate um, in law, but what, and maybe Scott, you could jump in as well on this. What have you seen that positively affects behavior during times where we need to reduce energy? Hmm. Yeah, Scott may have more data data on this. He's smiling because he's like, yes, I do billions and billions of data points. Um, yeah, I'll say for this pilot project, um, we didn't get quite the response that we were wanting and, and we want to be careful too. what we do know is that we if we over email people and we over contact people they don't appreciate that and i know that's that's the same for me right every time i get an email in my personal inbox i'm like why is someone emailing me so we really have to find the right ways to um communicate with people that that doesn't get tiring because there's fatigue right so it doesn't get tiring but that still gets the results that we want. And, you know, we're with the second round of pilot, we're still dialing that in, in a way that that makes our customers want to voluntarily participate. Um, and Scott's off mute, what you got? Ms. Yeah, so, so we've seen the same thing um, with um, over communicating, right? They'll opt out, um, things like that. Um, it, you know, we, we've, seen two approaches that that are really effective number one is rebates that make a meaningful difference to those folks um, so if you're talking about a household where their uh, annual income is a couple hundred thousand dollars a hundred dollar savings over the course of a summer is really not going to make a meaningful difference to them and and your, your participation uh, is not going to be great it's just not unfortunately um, we do see a small select group of folks that are hyper vigilant, uh, regardless of income level and want to do the right thing. And when ERCOT makes a call for, uh, a, a, you know, an emergency action that they really do, uh, reduce their, uh, power, even though there is no economic incentive for them. Um, but, uh, the, the, the. Outside of economic incentives, if you can put systems in, and we've, we've done this uh, with University of Michigan, we had an RPE funded program where we got air conditioners to, to in, in aggregate to follow a frequency regulation signal. Uh, and we were able to do that with without allowing a temperature deviation that the homeowner noticed. Um, if you can do these sorts of events sort of automated behind the scenes, uh, without impacting the homeowner's quality of life, your your participation can be quite high. We did, I think, 17 or 19 events over that course of that summer. Uh, each of them had 100 households in it. So that's, you know, 17, 1900 total household events. And we had two opt outs uh, because the system was so good at keeping uh, that that event from being noticeable. There was less of a temperature deviation and a humidity deviation in the home. So. So you, you, you just didn't see people opting out of it. So, so either bring, bring buckets of cash to get them to, to, to do it or make it an automated system that they don't notice the, the operation. You'll have high, high levels of participation. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm actually a fan of demand uh, time of use rates, but that, I don't know if utilities are implementing that on residential customers. Uh, one last question I want to address. Uh, someone mentioned about uh, air conditioners heating up uh, the planet, but I just, as yeah, I'm in a green building myself, I'm one of the green building uh, project managers, and air conditioners don't actually create heat. Heat is neither created nor destroyed, it's just transferred. So we're taking heat inside the house, moving it out. Uh, that's kind of principle of air conditioning. So air conditioners don't actually heat the planet any more than. The heat already exists. Um, so, Caitlin, I'll let you close us out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Robert, for leading that. And thank you to our speakers for all of your great insight. And thank you to everyone else for attending. We really appreciate it. 
Um, so you see that survey slide up here. Please take a moment to complete the survey link that uh, Robert's going to place in chat. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and helps us plan for future webinars. As a reminder, you will receive a certificate if you attended the entire webinar today. The seminar will also be added to our new e-learning platform in about six weeks, where you can watch the recording, take a quiz, and earn CEUs. Check out the current courses at this link and log in to get started. And everyone that registered will also receive a follow-up email with resource links, including a recording of this webinar. So thank you all again. This concludes our webinar for today.